I would like to introduce our first honored guest. Each honored guest and speaker has been invited to tell his or her story of their call to serve God and us. So please first welcome Nancy Norton, Territorial Director for Consecrated Women of Working Christi, North America. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, what a beautiful event and it's a delight and really an honor to be here to share in the celebration of communion together. And I was speaking to a group a, a week or two ago and we were talking about communion. And I think there was something we agreed on that communion is something that's experienced. It's almost something intangible, right? It's hard to put into words, but I think in this room we know what it is and we're experiencing it right now. So um, I just don't want to skip a step. So I'm just going to take a moment to answer the, the question that I know is out there somewhere. And it is, what exactly is a consecrated woman of Regnum Christi? <laughs> so just a little brief explanation of who we are and our vocation. So consecrated women of Regnum Christi, at the heart of it all, are where women who have responded to a call from God to belong totally to Jesus Christ. And uh, that involves leaving everything behind and following behind him and imitating the life that he lived of poverty, chastity, and obedience. We do this in the lay state. We're not religious. We're lay women totally dedicated to God, totally consecrated to him. And we live in community with other consecrated women. And we are one piece one part, one branch, we say, of the tree, of the body, of the Regnum Christi movement. So um, we're, we're blessed tonight because we have all four of those pieces, all four of those branches present in this room. The Legionaries of Christ, the consecrated women, the consecrated men, and the Regnum Christi men and women. So it's beautiful to be here together. What's the mission of the consecrated women of Regnum Christi? Really? It's our mission is our daily surrender. It's the surrender of our lives to Jesus, whose personal love has changed us forever. And the experience of that love is what brings us to bring his mercy, his gaze to as many people as we possibly can. We do that primarily through a life of prayer. And um, we have um, a lot of daily prayer interwoven throughout our uh, the hours of the day, and also apostolic action. And whatever is going to contribute to the establishment of the kingdom of Christ in society, you've heard these words before, I know. And um, so it's through the, the accompaniment of the, the evangelization process, right, that people are in, knowing Christ, being formed in their faith, and being launched in the church as active apostles. So we do this by building and promoting communion in the church and in our Regnum Christi family. There are about 600 of us in the world. We're in 14 countries, and here in the U.S., we're in eight cities. We would love to have a community in New York. We had a community uh, up to a couple of years ago, and um, we needed to do some reorganization and consolidation in some of our communities. So I would ask you to pray for vocation so we can come back and reestablish a community in the, in the tri-state area. So that was a very brief explanation of us and our vocation. And um, for more information, please consult a consecrated woman near you. <laughs> there are several here in the room, and I just want to uh, introduce them really quickly. If you could just raise your hand when I call your name. Glory Darbele used to serve in this area for many years. She was about here for about 10 years. We're happy to have her to here today. And Lisa introduced Cecile, who is still able to come and visit every once in a while. <laughs> Sonia Baldwin, also from Australia, but living in Chicago and here visiting today. Lucy Honor is also here, present from the Washington, D.C. area. And our National Vocations Director is Adrienne Rowles, and she's here in the room, there in the back. She was our cantor for the Mass. I think that's everyone, right? Yep. 
Okay, well, um, we're speaking about communion today. And as we were saying, true communion is, is it's really a gift from God. And I would like to suggest that we human beings play a part in facilitating that gift, in fostering that gift. And re doing a little bit more reflection about what I was going to share with you. There's so much to share, but I, I guess I landed here that communion can't really exist without true human encounters. I took a plane this morning from Atlanta to LaGuardia, got off the plane, and there in, um, in the gate area of Terminal D, there's a little restaurant, and they have tables of two. Most of them are tables of two. And so it's two seats facing each other, right? And in front of each person, facing each person, is a little iPad. And so both people have an iPad facing them, right? And that's in between um, the person on the other side. So I just thought, wow, this is a culture that needs encounters, right? <laughs> that there's a lot of room of, of recreating human encounters. So. Lisa asked me to share something about the journey of my vocation, but that's a, that's a long story. And I thought maybe what I would do is just mention one particular encounter of so many thousands that made a great dif difference along the way of my vocation. So the first real experience I think I had of Raina Christie was on a silent spiritual exercises retreat for young women in Wakefield, Rhode Island. Many of you have probably been there back in the day. And I had graduated from college a year earlier and was then working a, as a paralegal. And um, there were about 30 other young women there and it was an eight day silent spiritual exercises retreat. I arrived a couple of days late so I was you know, a little bit lost at the beginning. Father Walter Barnicki, I don't know if you know that name, but he's the first American legionary and actually from the tri-state area, he's from New Jersey. So he was, um, he was preaching the retreat, and I guess I can say at that time in my life I was just in a lot of vocational turmoil. Apparently I had a lot or most of what life was supposed to offer to make you happy, but there was a lot of emptiness inside. So I felt that God had really been asking for my attention for a little while, for me to listen, but I was very, very, very afraid of what that might imply for me. So it's kind of like, I guess I have the image, it was as, as if God was knocking on the door of my preppy little life and saying, open up. I have a few more things for you to consider. And I was not interested at all. I really wasn't. In fact, I remember feeling that, that interior tension in such a strong way and finally getting to the point that during that retreat, I would go into the silent moments of prayer and I, I prayed this prayer and I would say, Lord, at the heart of it all, I just don't trust that you and you alone can make me happy. And that's just the plain, ugly truth. I don't trust you. I don't. And I don't trust what you're asking of me. I don't trust it. So enter Father Walter. I would come into the room, right, in the, where, where we would listen to Father Walter preach, and I would wedge my way back into the back row. And um, I don't know if you've ever met Father Walter, but he's a very gifted preacher. He's a very spiritual man, and he has a gift of, of bringing Christ alive in the Gospels. But that actually, even though that was happening, it wasn't the main encounter that I had. What happened was the following. Father Walter, you know, he would have his, his papers here, they would be talking about Jesus acting in a, in a particular moment of the gospel. I don't know, the Samaritan woman at the well or whatever. And he would, he, he would stop. And he would just pause. And then he would say, and if one of you is telling God that you don't think that he and he alone can make you happy, <laughs> God wants to tell you this. And he would verbalize, put into words, a response of Christ assuring the unimaginable joy and hope and happiness that came from responding a call to belong to him. Okay, this didn't just happen once. 
it happened like five times during those days. So um, I was, fr first of all, very spooked. <laughs> it was a little bit scary at the beginning, but then I realized this is, this is, this is God speaking directly to me. And so there was something of an, a very profound encounter. I mean, this was a person I had never seen before in my life, who I'd never met. I came in late to the retreat. He probably didn't even notice that I was in the room. He probably didn't know that I was there. But because of his prayerful openness and docility to the Holy Spirit, because it, he was just in a constant state of being open to God, he became the instrument of Jesus Christ's direct encounter with my soul. And I guess that's what I'm left with, right? When we're seeking God and when, we're, when we are really united with him, sometimes we are just totally unaware of the encounters we facilitate and provoke between Jesus and other people. And this, this is our mission in Regnum Christi. This is our mission. So long story short, I got consecrated a year later in 1998. That was 17 years ago. And um, it's been a beautiful journey. And that's, that's the even more beautiful story to tell, but I don't have time today. So our encounters, maybe they're silent. Maybe they're unconscious. Maybe they are intentional at times. They transmit a grace, a presence of God in our midst. And what is that when we, again, are united with God? And this doesn't mean a mystical union. It means seeking God in our imperfection, in our weakness. We become agents of true human encounters directly with other people and between other people and God. I just want to end with a few words from our Holy Father, Pope Francis, who a year ago was speaking to um, ecclesial movements like Regnum Christi and speaking about this, that these encounters that build a culture of communion, a church of communion. We must never forget that the most precious good, the seal of the Holy Spirit, is communion. Thus, the supreme blessing that Jesus won for us on the cross the grace which the risen Christ continually implores for us as he reveals to the Father his glorious wounds, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And he says this at the end. For the world to believe that Jesus is Lord, it needs to see communion among Christians. So this is our mission, and I thank you for, part for participating in that. Thank you very much.